Today on episode 815 of CXO Talk, we're discussing the executive order from the White House on artificial intelligence and responsible AI. Our guest is David Bray. He's a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center. It is a Washington-based think tank. Give us a sense of why you're qualified to talk about this. I was crazy enough to be recruited by the government when I was 15 because I was good with computers. They had me working initially building computer simulations at a physics facility. Later, I actually started working on some classified DoD satellites uh, involving some interesting um, computer technologies. And at the time, those were expert systems, which was a version of AI, decision support systems. Fast forward, later worked in bioterrorism preparedness response, was part of the response to 9-11 and the anthrax events. And there too, we were using, it wasn't the version of generative AI, we have now, but it was using a flavor of AI and played a role working with the intelligence community where we reviewed all the research development programs of the US intelligence community. Obviously, AI was a part of that back in 2012, 2013. Four years at the Federal Communications Commission, while we didn't do a lot of AI because it was mainly just upgrading their legacy systems, we did successfully lead the way in terms of moving to cloud there. Uh, which at the time was not something that a lot of government agencies had considered. So it was actually in an operational role. And then with Vent Surf and the People Centered Internet Coalition back in 2017 to 2020, uh, actually looked at how we could make the internet more people centered, but also thinking about AI. Uh, I did actually also play a role in 2020 and 2021, right before Stimson, where it was actually now not just the US, but our Canadian, our UK, our Australian and New Zealand allies, as well as other countries like Japan and Germany and India that we also partner with. When we talk Talk about an executive order very briefly. What is that? Just to give us some context. Presidents have the ability to issue executive orders, which means they are taking right now what what authorities they have as president through the Constitution and any other laws that have been passed by the Congress, and then issuing directions to the departments and agencies to move forward. So they can't necessarily create anything if they don't have the authority to do that. But if they already have the authority as the president through the Constitution and through laws that were passed, they're now giving guidance as the essentially the commander in chief of the executive branch as to how departments and agencies should move forward. The executive order then ideally can last past the administration unless there's additional updates or rescinding by future administrations. And in this case, we're talking about this executive order on responsible AI. Give us a, a just a high level overview of, of what it actually is. It's been building. It's a long time coming. Um, it, it was about a year in the making and there were different draft versions going around. But even before then, you saw at the very end of the President Obama administration, there were actions on AI that were done through the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is part of the executive office of the president. And then underneath the Trump administration, you also saw some actions that were coming out again mainly through the Office of Science and Technology Policy. This is now actually at the executive president office of the president level. So the president uh, himself is putting forward the idea of how we move forward consistently, both within government, but also with the business sector. And so briefly, what it calls out for is first, thinking about new standards for AI safety and security. And that's really the heart of what this executive order is looking at. It kind of is an unprecedented in terms of length executive order. It's more than 110 pages long, depending on the, the type font and the, everything you're doing. That's very long for an executive order. So I'm going to briefly sort of highlight it. We can always dive deep uh, deeper on the specific issues. But as it calls out that new standards for AI safety and security, it's actually requiring that developers of powerful AI systems share their test results before they actually release their product to the market. It's also thinking about tools and tests and standards, because right now we do not have a good sense of what are the standards for actually demonstrating that AI systems are secure. And Michael, you and I can talk a little bit about how that might be challenging with the design choices in generative AI at the moment. Also, then it's calling out a need to actually ensure that AI does not enable people to do bad things with biology, which is, again, from my bioterrorism background days, it's something I'm intimately aware of. And then ultimately seeing that Americans need to be protected from AI-enabled fraud and deception. Uh, generative AI, unfortunately, is going to create a whole lot of fraud and disinformation. And I know we've had conversations on past so, uh, uh, um conversations about that. And then thinking about cybersecurity, 
Because again, these could actually, you know, how do you understand the vulnerabilities of an AI system and how it might be either poisoned through data or other cybersecurity exploits? And finally, actually saying there's going to be additional follow-up that you, you will expect to see as a national security memo. And so that's charging what's called the national security staff in the area of what needs to also be done with AI and security, thinking more geopolitically. There's some additional things underneath that, but I'll pause there because I realized that was a lot uh, to just give up up front in terms of what the executive order calls out. David, this executive order is so far reaching. If you look at the language, it's very specific in a lot of different areas. It's very specific in terms of calling out what government agencies, for example, must do. So there there are wide ranging implications. Why now? Why did they release it at this particular time? We just had the one year mark of ChatGPT being released. And so I think that 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 ignited the public's uh, focus and attention and zeitgeist in ways that were not expected. And so in some respects, there was a huge interest in question. Um, they had previously done work on what was called the AI uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, and so this is sort of now actually sort of codifying what was a voluntary bill of rights. So those bill of rights that were issued at no point in time were actually enshrined in actual law. They were voluntary. And this is now the president using the authority they have as a presidential administration, short of Congress passing anything, to put a marker in the sand as to what needs to be done. And that's why, to your question, why do we see government agencies being called out? Well, because the president can direct government agencies. As for the bri- the, the, the business sector, the president cannot tell the business sector, obviously, what to do. That's part of what makes the United States uh, an open society. However, the president can ask for government agencies to put in place either standards or ways of interacting with the business sector. And that's how it's going to have inter- impacts on the business sector through what the government agencies are putting in place, whether it's with standards, whether it's with regulations or things like that, if they have the current authority to do so. In some cases, we may have to ha- wait for Congress to pass that authority so then the government agencies can do specific things. And we have a question on Twitter from our good friend, Anthony Scrifignano, who's one of the most prominent data scientists in the world. And Anthony says, you mentioned fraud. Can you talk a little about how this executive order addresses novel fraud, meaning fraud that has never been seen before? This kind of fraud cannot be simply modeled or learned through generative AI. What generative AI is really good at doing is 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 creating things that look like data it's been fed. And, and I don't want to be alarmist. That's not what I seek to do. But I have seen um, that for less than 10 minutes of compute time with some additional plugins and using what's called Worm GPT, which is the, the, the supposedly the dark side cousin uh, of uh, Chat GPT, you can create about a million realistic looking records of um, healthcare claims. Um, that are at $200 or less, which is below the fraud threshold. And so this is novel in the sense that it's going to look realistic. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be below the cost that you would normally spend to actually try to authenticate if it's real or not. And if you did a million of those, and let's say it was healthcare, you know, it was claims in the middle of December for upper respiratory infection. You know, if, if those were submitted, most people just think that's just a blip in terms of what's happening naturally. And so, Uh, It calls out that the Department of Commerce is going to be putting a lot of thought in it. Uh, It says content authentication. It also mentions watermarking, and I'm not sure watermarking by itself will solve it, and I think that's probably implicit in what Anthony is saying. And it's recognizing that what the technology gives us, which is the the, the sheer ability to produce human-looking content, realistic-looking content, whether it's photo, text, or the like, it's also going to unfortunately empower those who will use it for bad purposes, including fraud and deception. Um, separate from this executive order, uh, about three and a half, four months ago, and I know we're friends with Lord Tim, uh, Michael, um, I was invited to actually talk to the UK government, which is actually thinking about what if by 2030, it'll be near impossible to separate what's authentic versus inauthentic in the public space. And so sort of, again, this is getting ahead of that coming wave, which is there's going to unfortunately be a lot of, there there already is a lot of disinformation and fraud online. This is only going to unfortunately multiply it and we need to get ahead of it now. Please subscribe to the CXO Talk newsletter to stay up to date and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have incredible shows coming up. Let's dive into the content of this executive order, and then 
we'll discuss the implications for us as individual citizens and for businesses and 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 so forth. So I think the best place to start is can you give us an overview of what this is and where do the tentacles reach? Recognizing I broke the sort of the highlights to talk about standards for AI safety and security. And that's really what this is focusing on. That then reaches into um, the, the parts of government that have touch points with the business sector in terms of ensuring that their products or services are, are safe and secure. There's another section that goes from there that actually talks about thinking about the the privacy uh, of those of us in the United States. And so how do you actually make sure that AI, you're thinking about privacy, because again, that that that's not something that's really hard to discern at the moment, because in some respects, the way we have, way, way businesses have chosen to launch generative AI, you have very little information, both on the data that was used to train the machine, as well as you have very little information about the parameters and, and the actual tweaking of the machine's algorithm. And so that's something that's being called out. That's kind of vague, but at least it's showing that the government is going to be taking this seriously and they actually are strengthening privacy preserving research, actually evaluating how the government collects and uses commercially available information to make sure privacy is protected, and then also trying to figure out guidelines for effectiveness. And I don't think you're going to see that right away because it's a hard problem. And we may actually run up against the fact that the current design choices we have with generative AI makes it really hard to demonstrate you've protected privacy, but it shows that government is very intent on solving that. Another touch point that it has is thinking about privacy, uh, sorry, equity and civil rights. And this, again, builds on the the aspirational uh, AI Bill of Rights that came out earlier, calling out clear guidance will be issued by government agencies to landlords, to federal benefits programs, and people who contract with the government that you actually have to demonstrate that your AI is not doing algorithmic discrimination. And also, they've also called out for the FBI and Department of Justice to think about fairness in the criminal justice system to make sure AI is not actually resulting in unfair treatment uh, within the justice system. Then there's actually thinking about, as I talk about in terms of consumers, patients, and students, this is kind of a little bit more vague, but it's saying that there needs to be responsible use. And in fact, the healthcare part still needs a lot of more definition. That's something that's absent here. And then also, how can AI transform education also needs to be sort of spelled out a little bit more. And I think that's going to be something that's going to be a very interesting space to watch for the next year and a half. And then thinking about workers, because we know there's may, there's possibly the possibility that people might be displaced from their jobs. So how can we mitigate the harms and maximize the benefits? And then also getting ahead of the curve of what the disruption is going to have. And again, recognize this is a big disorder, a big, big executive order. I'm going to give you three more parts of it, thinking about how we can actually do research. And so this is calling out for a national AI research service. That's something that businesses can tap into, promoting competitive and a fair and open AI ecosystem. And then also, how do we hire for for talent? There's also a call out that involves the Department of State and thinking internationally about what are the relationships we have with different countries, but that should also support international commerce and how we collaborate. And finally, saying that there actually needs to be guidance for the AI use within government. And so you already see the Office of Management and Budget preparing that implementation guidance and asking for feedback and comment. And then also ensuring that if government agencies use AI, They actually have sort of spelled out how they're using it and they can hire the talent to make it happen. And that's why you see more than 110 pages, because that's a lot in one executive order. Is there a set of unifying goals or principles or glue that kind of binds the whole thing together? I would submit that we're now in a world in which in the past, between the time government issued policy and did something, It was about a ripple effect between three to five years before you started to see impact, and then it would have impact over the next decade. I think now with the rate of technology change, and as I tell people, the good news is we're democratizing technology. The challenging news is we're democratizing technology. So that means faster decision cycles, faster impact cycles. I think you're now seeing it's between three to six months between government making a policy decision and it's starting to have impacts on the marketplace, on businesses, on the nation. And then it probably has a long tail of between 18 to 36 months before you're going to have to do something else, which means basically this is a very impactful policy with a time horizon between six months to three years. And so we've got to learn by doing because that's just so fast. And what I think I would really like to see as a next step to sort of build on this is I quite frankly think 
it would be wonderful if we could call out three demonstration projects that would involve the public, that would involve businesses, that would involve the private sector, nonprofits, and universities around AI, and just pick three and say, we're going to take everything that's in this 110 plus page document, but we're actually going to sort of bring people around it and learn by doing and, and be focused around three issues. And so maybe one would involve how AI could help improve delivery of healthcare or how it could actually improve delivery of services to citizens, because that's key. Another one might be actually thinking about how it could actually improve access to education or, or making education more accessible, something like that. And a third one, maybe it's more in the national security domain. We know, unfortunately, we live in an open world in which some of our service women and men may actually have, unfortunately, vulnerabilities where their data is online to other countries. And so can we use AI to both detect that, protect them, and protect them so that they don't feel exposed to possibly whatever uh, other outside nations might do to, to take advantage of the fact that we are an open society and we have information online. But regardless, pick three demonstration projects, and then that can instantiate and solidify all the aspirations present in this executive order. We have a really interesting question from Chris Peterson on Twitter, who is asking about artificial general intelligence and where where is the intersection between AGI and this order, or even something that sort of looks a little bit like AGI, you know, more powerful AI than we currently have broadly today. Artificial general intelligence is not here yet. We still have general generative intelligence, but that's different. It's worth noting that what we have right now with generative AI are systems that are really good if the present and the future looks exactly like the data they've trained on. So in other words, if the past is informing the past, the future and present, we're great. But if the present and future is different, that's when you see generative AI get kind of weird and wonky. And we actually saw this with COVID. Um, it wasn't called generative AI at the time, but you know, we already heard from Anthony and others. There were AI systems that kind of went off the rails when COVID happened because the world fundamentally behaved differently after that. And so the hope with artificial general intelligence is you, if we take the most basic definition of a system that is able to not just learn about the past and apply it to the present, but also be curious and, and explore mental models or digital models in the case might be about what the future might be and, and actually have that sort of uh, that applicability. So it doesn't go off the rails if the future is different than the past. Um, so the good news is a lot of this calls out similar actions you should take whether you're talking about the current generative AI that we have or if and when AGI shows up. So this is goodness regardless. What, what, what I think is still needed here is one, conversations about data. Um, it's interesting that the data is not really discussed much here. And I think, especially in open societies like the United States, but also other nations like Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, and others, we've got to think about how people can have voice and how their data is employed. And I think that's needed, whether you have AGI or AI, that's not present. And what does that look like? How do you actually bring people together? Because most of us don't have time to, to navigate it all. So it may actually be a collective action problem. The second thing is, if AGI was the surface, how do we have these sufficient constraints to make sure it doesn't go off the rails and start doing things that we don't want it to do? Now, I'm not one of those people that's an AI doomsdayer. I don't think that's the case. Um, I often tell people, replace the word AI with very fast organizations, because that's what AI really is. It, it, in some respects, the same approach, whether you call them laws, policies, et cetera, that we want to apply to very fast organizations, we should also apply to AI because, you know, despite the doomsayer arguments that somehow AI is going to take over the world, I don't see that. And I think there's several AI experts that would also agree with that. And so with AGI, it's just more, how do we make sure we have the appropriate constraints? And then finally, and again, this gets to sort of what I was hinting about earlier. It may very well be the design choices we've made with the current version of generative AI may not give us the sufficient ability to test and have confidence in that. Um, for example, if I asked you, do you want to cross this bridge, Michael? And you'd probably ask me, well, how did you design the bridge? And if we can't explain that, then that, that's kind of problematic. 
But let's say you say, okay, you can't tell me how you design a bridge. Can you tell me what materials, what data in this case, or what what physical materials you use to build build a bridge? And if you can't explain that either, the question is, do you really want to cross that bridge? And so I think we may need to think about other models, and I've seen some, and we can actually talk about that if you want. I've seen other models that give me hope that we will have better approaches to future flavors of AI, whether it's AI or AGI, that will allow us to know that it's constrained enough that it's not going to do things that we don't want it to do. One of the points that you are making is the uncertain nature of the evolution of artificial intelligence and the fact that we have an executive order that is static in time that has far-reaching ramifications into the future, even though we don't know what's going to happen with that future. Correct. On that subject, we have a, a, a very interesting question, again, from Twitter, and this is from Arsalan Khan, who says, when all of government tries to do AI standards, it becomes very difficult. The execution is difficult because the standards folks might not be fully aware of how each agency works. And he's asking about the implications of that for this, because this executive order is very explicit with different departments doing certain things together. I often have the phrase that standards are like toothbrushes. Everybody needs one. They just don't want to use anybody else's. And then you've, you've seen with XKCD, they also have the, there are 14 standards. We must bring a standard to bring everything together. There are now 15 standards. And so... That's, again, why I make the call for let's pick three demonstration projects, because that will bring the different departments and agencies together in a unified way, as opposed to a disjointed way. The other thing that I would say is we should we should look to what's already there. And I'm going to give a shout out to two 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 entities. One is um, there there is a Gazelle Waters who has worked with IEEE, and I know, Michael, you and I have done things with IEEE, that has advanced a standard for the procurement, how you think about the procurement of AI which I think is something that businesses or governments could use, because that's really where you can actually specify how are you using the data? How are you demonstrating to me that there's safety in this? And that's an existing standard that she's been advocating through IEEE. So, so again, um, shout out to Gavelle, because I think that's something people can look to. The second is I'm going to put uh, another shout out there. There's actually work on IEEE there, uh, standards for, for spatial web. And the reason why this gets interesting is, imagine if another way to approach AI is to say that things in the real world have XYZ coordinates and time coordinates. And you can actually say, only consider this data if it's involving this space. And so if it's inside your house, maybe that's only you get to have the choice on what's used with the data. But if it's outside the house, let's say it's an airport, then the airport authority and the government gets to have a choice. And, and you can actually say like, you know, Cars should stay on roads. Drones should not fly into buildings. And so you can use physical boundaries to have some confidence that the AI will perform safely. And what's interesting is you can actually then flip it on its head and actually apply that to law and medicine where you may not have physical boundaries, but you have legal boundaries or you have policy boundaries and it works. And that's an IEEE standard that's also out there. So I would love us to, to not create new because then we're just going to propagate that problem of too many toothbrushes. But if we look to things like IEEE and the existing standards, and those are the two that I would start with, procurement and spatial web, that will give a framework that regardless of whether it's our government, the UK government, businesses or whatever, everybody can build from. What about the implementation aspects of this? I mean, we've, we've really just scratched the surface in terms of the content because it is so big, this executive order. But what about the actual implementation and execution of it? How does that take place? It's worth remembering that it was around 2008, 2009 that, that previous administrations called out, let's go to the cloud government. And even when I was at the, the, the FCC from 2013 to 2017, um, and we made that big leap where we moved all of our systems either to public cloud or private hosting, uh, I think we were one of, you know, it was like 55 or 6% of government agencies at that time had made that leap. And I think the news that is somewhere between 15 and 20%. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's more than 15 years since the original call. On top of it, it's gotten a lot harder to do implementation in a, you know, the good news is we have 24 seven news, we have more transparency, but the bad news is we also have more spin and disinformation. And so, 
you know, and, and I've had these conversations, not just with government folks, but private sector folks, a lot of people are afraid of things not working out well. And how that, you know, the perception of failure, even if it's not failure, might be spun, or the perception of a bad choice, even if it was a good choice, might be spun. And so, oddly, I would submit in this AI era, we also have resulted in an environment that has resulted in very risk-averse uh, implementation. Nobody wants to be the first one because they're worried you might get shot at. And so, that's where I think the case needs to be made that that the presidential administration has to provide top cover to these initiatives, that if you leave it to the individual departments and agencies, there's a risk that they'll get shot at or things will be spun out and things will become political. But if you pick three, and again, I'd pick three things that in some respects are nonpartisan in nature or bipartisan or whatever you want to say. It, it's One example I'll give is there's an effort called Birth to Three, which ensures that every individual in the United States um, between the ages of when they're born and three years old should get the physical, mental, and emotional services they need. Now that involves forms. Forms are one, you have to go and fill them out. You have to have the time to go fill them out and you have to know which form to do. Most caregivers for infants don't have the time to do that. So what if instead we use the combination of an AI system and SMS texting, like basic texting, you don't even need a smartphone to say, I would like to get the following physical service or emotional health service for my child. And it says, okay, what are you looking for? Give me some details. And before you know it, not only have you applied for the service and been vetted, but it's been a conversation and you can get back to them much faster. It's not waiting six to 12 months for a response. That I think is the future of government where it's not filling out forms or knowing to write forms. It's more of a conversation. But what if we said this is going to be a, you know, I don't want to put words in the administration. It's up to them what they want to do, but it's going to be at the level of this is something championed by the administration. And it's going to obviously involve many different departments and agencies. The nice thing is that implementation has now top cover from what might normally be, you know, people that are risk averse or being scared of being taken out of context if they didn't have that. And so I think that's why, again, I keep on going back to, in some respects, it's almost like, imagine if, if instead of one NASA during the space race, we had said, let's have 30 or 40 different NASAs and you all go take the different risk. You know, that would never have worked. We've got to have this be more of a, let's have a focused, let's give top cover for those who are brave and bold enough and benevolent enough to be willing to stick their necks out and try and do the implementation of AI because there is no textbook here. And you think that this executive order provides enough cohesion that it will help bring the parties together? It's worth going back to the 1890s and 1900s, where there was massive disinformation and similarly polarization. The Congress was actually even more polarized in the 1890s and 1900s than it was now. And there was rapid technological innovation. It may very well be that open societies as a response to stress respond in such way. That's exactly why I think you see that sort of hesitancy is nobody wants to have anything they do taken out of context. And as one who has lived through this and survived and come out the other end, you have to almost get over it. You have to just say, look, I'm going to try and do the right thing. And I cannot, you know, my, almost like Marcus Aurelius, I cannot control however other people will spin it. Um, this executive order, it's interesting. It does not deconflict between the call out for chief AI officers, separate from chief information officers, separate from chief technology officers, separate from chief information security officers, separate from chief data officers. And so that's a potential risk here. That said, all is not lost because, as again, it calls out for both the Office of Management and Budget that oversees how funds are spent per whatever Congress passed to give implementation guidance. And so they may be able to resolve that. And OMB also could try and solve how are they going to give top cover so that people are brave, bold, and benevolent enough to be willing to be leaning forward versus saying they're doing something but really hesitant because nobody wants to risk their 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 reputation or career on something that might go boom, not because anything was done wrong, but just because this is hard stuff to do. Anthony Scrifignano comes back and he says, kudos for addressing the speed of AI democratization versus the pace of regulatory evolution. Is there a related concern that places with less regulatory focus could create enclaves either for faster innovation or malfeasance? And I'll just ask you to address this point in the context of the executive order. The executive order calls out the need for us to partner with several nations of similar mindset as us. So it calls out UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, but also colleagues in Europe and around the world. 
And I think that's a recognition that sort of implicit to what Anthony just asked. I just gave you all the reasons why in our our, our checks and balance system, our, our open society that has separations and divisions between the legislature and the executive branch and the judicial branch, that that we may be more deliberative and slow as opposed to more autocratic systems, which is if the autocracy wants to go somewhere, they're going to go it. And if and if if someone doesn't like it, they're either fired imprisoned and or killed, which is awful, but that that's the way. So AI might interestingly be enough. Implementation of AI might actually benefit more unilateral autocracies or autocracies in thought, as opposed to the more deliberative nature of our pluralist system of government. And so this executive order calls out the one that need to partner with other countries and allies, because again, we don't have the monopoly on the best of insights. I mean, there are other countries that are there. And two, that's where you see the call out for the National Security Council to come up with a memo because I think it's probably thinking of that dimension, which is how do we not fall behind because of our in, our deliberativeness while at the same time not race ahead unilaterally without thinking about, you know, what makes our society good is there is deliberation. There are differences of opinion. That's what we want to have happen. But we also don't want it to slow us down so much that we are essentially we lose the race even before we start. We have a question from Arsalan Khan who says, if the government is asking to review and regulate security features before AI is released to the public by the private sector, and we know the government is slow and and doesn't always have the expertise, isn't this just going to slow down AI progress overall? I would not disagree with you, Arslan. That said, I'll give you some hope, which is what if instead of this being done by government, this is either through grants to universities, grants to nonprofits, grants to other institutions outside of government that can move faster. And, and it's interesting, universities uh, right now have the highest trust level. I think they have more trust than, than, than either the private sector or government in terms of perceptions in US society, but also nonprofits could. Um, that those are the places that could actually do this and they're funded through grants. And the nice thing is you can maybe initially fund say five to 10 different demonstration projects throughout the country, because I think you're going to find that one, you can't do a one size fits all to AI. It's going to be domain specific. You're going to need one for healthcare and what you do for healthcare is going to be different than what you do for cars and what you do for AI and education, for example. And so you're going to need to do that. And two, it could actually be performance-based. And so the government agency says, look, we're going to fund you for the following outcomes. We're not going to tell you how to do it. So that gives you the freedom to explore and move fast, but we're looking for the following outcomes, whether it's improvement of delivery of services at a faster time or greater reach or things like that. So it could actually be outcome-based policy and spending. Now that said, this does point to, we need more operational implementation oriented nonprofits and universities. Cause we have a lot of universities and nonprofits, and this is not the calling one out specifically that are great at writing papers and admiring the issue. But now in today's era, we need to actually have more operationally focused nonprofits that are held to actually deliver results because they can move faster and they can explore the space better than the government by itself. Is this actually going to work? I'm an eternal optimist. I think anything you get, you can use it as a way to motivate goodness in the world. You know, there may be people that will detract at it or say there's goals and there's gaps in it. And there are possibly gaps in it. Um Partly why I love the Simpson Center, and I'm going to give a call out to Simpson, is they are an operational NGO, um, think tank. And, and so they're a think and do tank. And, 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 and so, you know, they're small. We don't have a lot of people. But it gives me hope that there can be places where people come together with a mission focus that that don't have the same either concern that whatever they do will be taken out of context or the or, or the same constraints that government agencies by themselves and if you look at again, I call back the space race um, example. You know, when we were pioneering to the moon, um, rockets blew up. You know, and things like that. And, but we didn't stop, and 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 everything like that. And so, but it also wasn't done exclusively by the government. The government partnered with the private sector. There were contractors that actually sort of built all the parts for the rockets. The government didn't build that, and there were also nonprofits involved with analyzing as to where they were going and things like that. Um, so. I think it is doable if we work in bringing together all the different parts of the US, not just one part. Um, I will also give one brief example that Project Corona, which was not done by NASA, this was actually done by the national security community, was in 1959, 1960, launched a rocket that would take photos of the Soviet Union 
and then parachute a film canister that would be picked up by a plane or helicopter. The first 13 rockets blew up. It wasn't until rocket attempt number 21 they succeeded. Obviously, that helped with the Cold War, but later in 1990s, it was declassified, bought by a company called Keyhole that was later bought by Google and became the basis of Google Earth. So I often say government is innovative. We just don't monetize it. We leave it to somebody else. But imagine if we tried Project Corona and now in an AI dimension or the equivalent thereof, how how tolerant are we as a public? How tolerant are we with our news media and Congress to have 13 rockets blow up before we finally succeed in getting it into orbit? And so the same thing is true with AI. I think we're going to have to figure out how can we do rapid solicitation from the private sector for solutions that can help here, rapid involvement of the public as well, and standing up for the public in terms of data stakeholderism, involvement and in how the AI is employed, and then finding those operationally Im implementation focused universities and nonprofits and say, look, we need you to help here because time is of the essence. And again, in the past, maybe we had 15 years between something being written and action. We really have between two to three years to get this right. And that's where I think where you said, you know, how will this impact decades from now? If we don't rise to the occasion, if we're held back either through division or polarization or fear, um, it, 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 it may actually be looking back as a missed opportunity for open societies. On this topic of interoperability, Arslan Khan, Khan comes back. And I'll, I'll ask you to answer this, David, very quickly, because we're running out of time. He says, where's the link between enterprise architecture and AI and government, since a lot of money has already been spent on en enterprise architecture? That's not called out in this executive order, but I will say I am working with an international nonprofit health group who has a lot of equivalent of enterprise architecture and the data standards around health and medical records. And one of the things that we are actively looking at is how can you use those data and standards to go to a generative AI system and effectively say, given what you know of enterprise architecture, given what you know of these data and technology standards, help me build a reference implementation model. Help me build an interconnect between system A and system B. And probably the first time we do it, it'll only get about 50 or 60% right. But then you have the humans sort of inform and help train the machine. The next time we do it, 70 or 80% right. I think the future of enterprise architecture is training the AIs to, with a human, build the interconnection and interoperability faster. So human plus AI. I wouldn't do it AI alone. But, you know, it, it, but if you can actually carve out and make it so that instead of spending six months to implement a system, you can now do it in less than six weeks. That may actually be how we solve the problem of AI is going to need to move faster and AI plus human can do enterprise architecture and data implementations faster too. David, what are the implications for business and technology leaders? In other words, should business people be thinking about this, doing anything about this today, or is it just still too soon? Definitely should be doing something about this because if you don't disrupt yourself, someone else will disrupt you. And that's not just coming from government. I mean, you know, if a business says we're going to wait and see whatever we're going to do in terms of AI, I guarantee you someone else is going to say, no, we're going to jump in. Um, I have had conversations with private sector CIO, CTO colleagues. I help advise some of them. And again, they're right now saying we do want to wait and see partly because of that fear factor and partly because of just, you know, it, it is, you know, a lot of AI, unfortunately, does have a lot of hype. And so they want to actually have that sort of ground truth. That said, I worry that it's going to give rise to boards creating this confusion between how is the chief AI officer relating to the CIO, the CTO, the CISO, and the CDO. And so what I would recommend right now, businesses should say, look, we're going to do two to three, you know, initial toe in the water. So let's explore this space and how it might change how we do business. Maybe it's just as simple of instead of us having to always write a press release, we can now actually involve the AI in that process or, or things like that, or, or, or thinking about how we do frequently asked questions within our own company, something that's just a toe in the water and say, we're going to do three or four small, not too expensive demonstration projects. Similarly, though, if you're involved with government as a federal contractor, if you're involved with government because your industry is regulated by government, if you're involved with government because you provide services, lean in because there, there there will be opportunities to help inform. And if you don't inform in this very short period, um, that, that wisdom that you can bring from the private sector might be actually to our detriment. And so I would say, don't go all in, but as a business leader, you have to recognize this will disrupt you. And it's a question of whether or not you're determining your own fate or you're letting someone else do that. Why will this disrupt you if you're a business leader? 
it will disrupt you because this changes the notion of how you get things done, how you deliver results to your business, um, who you involve. I am hopeful that it's not exclusively AI versus humans. It's actually humans plus AI. It's augmented intelligence is another word for saying it or collective intelligence. And if you want your employees to be smarter, if you want your frontline delivery people to be smarter, you want to pair them with AI. You don't want to replace them with it, but you want to pair them with this because they'll no more be able to respond faster to both opportunities as well as risk. But very specifically, the executive order. Yes. So this executive order impacts you because this is how the business landscape will be shaped through the actions of government, including standards, including regulations, including policies. It will also be how the way you do business with other nations, if you're an international entity, will be shaped. Uh, I am, and, and so you have to recognize that the business landscape is being changed by the technology and what government does will reshape your sector and will reshape the industry. So coming down the pike is going to be one whole lot of regula regulation and government oversight in AI. I think that's a political choice, which I can't weigh in. Even if it's not quote unquote regulation, if the 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 guidance, the involvement, and the way that government is choosing to either use or not use, or the way that the Department of Justice and FBI is pursuing whether things are fair or not fair, whether other determinations are being done, you know, you don't necessarily see that as regulation, but it is shaping forces from the actions of these different governments and and where they're putting their money, where they put their money, where they choose to put their focus, where they choose to put their attention that will shape things with or without regulation. And Arsalan comes back with our final question. And he says, should we have an, a chief AI officer that is actually an AI to help agencies understand where they can use AI and how they should be responding to this executive order? I don't want to dismiss human chief AI officers, but I actually think that makes a little bit more sense because the C-suite is already crowded enough as it is. And in some respects, maybe it's not even a chief AI officer. It really is just a AI assistant, digital assistant, additional perspective on your C-suite and on your board to say, have, have you thought about this? Because again, not everything that generative AI produces is real. Not only is, is, is actually valid and, and it will actually change his mind. And so you have to be ready for hallucinations. But what we've seen generative AI good for, especially in medical settings, is those exotic edge cases. You know, a physician's really good at diagnosing flu or RSV or whatever, but if something's really exotic and you've never seen it before, the AI might say, have you thought about this? And so if you're in a business context, it might say, look, you think it's this, but have you thought about this? And so almost having that AI be the, the, the edge case thinker, but don't let it go off on its own, involve it in whatever you're doing in your business. And with that, we are out of time. A huge thank you to Dr. David Bray. Thank you, David, for taking the time to be with us and teach us about this executive order. Well, thank you, Michael. It's always a joy to be here with you on CXO Talk. Well, I really appreciate it. And a huge thank you to our audience. You guys are an amazing audience. All those, the very intelligent, bright questions that you ask. Now, before you go, please subscribe to the CXO Talk newsletter to stay up to date and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have incredible shows coming up. So check out CXOTalk.com and we will see you again next time. Have a great day.